Thank you so much, very much, Nishta. Thanks for having me. What do you would think is more defining for you, your profession or your personality? Well, that's rather like asking a mother or a father as to who their favorite child is. I use my career to fund my activism and my activism is what brings me joy and allows me to focus on my career. The sum of the parts is greater than the individual. I was actually uh, googling your name and uh, I was actually struck by all the headlines. So who is Saurabh Kirpal? This was the standard template of headlines. The advocate who could be India's first gay judge. How do you feel about these headlines? It doesn't really bother me. Of course, the fact that I'm going to be potentially or maybe never, <laughs> India's first gay judge is a, a fact to be determined and is an important fact about me, not just to me, but to the entire queer community. But of course, that's not who I am. Oh, that's not all who I am. And that's a very insubstantial portion of what I am. Uh, I believe I'm an author, I'm a lawyer, I'm a husband, a son, the way everybody is, right? We can't have a reductionist point of view about anyone's life. Absolutely, but do you, do you also feel that when it comes to uh, queer individuals, members of the queer uh, uh, community, they somehow get reduced to their sexuality and nothing beyond that. So it becomes um, an unmistakable and unslippable sort of epithet that has to be used all the time. I think that's absolutely correct. Uh, is it the best way to be? There I'm slightly conflicted. Uh, of course it is not the best way to be for that individual. Mm -hmm. right? So every time I'm called just that gay lawyer, uh, it's frankly a bit disconcerting and even demeaning. But from the perspective of a queer person sitting in rural India, a young law student, uh, a person who doesn't have the means that I do, when they Google my name and, and they see that there is, hey, there's a queer person out there right. who is a lawyer, who who's aspiring to high constitutional office, for them it's encouraging, mm -hmm. for them it's hopeful. So. So be it, if I can help someone that way, right. by being reduced to something. Of course. Uh, but you, do you feel that there is a, this, this you know, very visual sort of contradiction? Here is this rainbow flag mm. and there is this black and white, like literally mm. black and white and rainbow. How do yeah. you bring the two worlds together? And it is true, it is not easy for a person without privilege to come out and succeed in a legal practice. But not easy does not mean impossible. And yes, the law is a conservative profession, but let me also tell you, it is a very liberal profession. After all, the freedoms that the queer individuals have in India today are because of what the courts gave them, right? So we can't forget that judges are liberal people, right? So I ask people to have courage. I ask people to have faith. And I also ask people to be agents of change. I think it's time that queer individuals try to colour the black and white of law with a bit of their personality. About the Chief Justice of India, I mean, the uh, gentleman has a chip on his shoulder already. The entire country, in a way, is, uh, is expecting uh, CJI Chandrachur to, to sort of, you know, make his mark. But as CJI, would he be able to do it? And uh, let's see what he's going to do. Will he slip now? How do you assess all of that? I think he must be aware of the expectation that is there on his shoulder. Mm -hmm. But he's also a seasoned judge, uh, extremely intelligent person. So he probably knows what he's setting himself up for. This is not going to be a surprise for, uh, for him. Uh, is he setting himself up for failure? Well, that depends on your perspective and your expectations of him. Mm -hmm. right? If you expect that he will deliver the moon, then I can already tell you that yes, uh, that's not going to happen. Uh, because our systems are inherently evolutionary in nature, right? We do not believe in, we do not subscribe to, our constitution does not permit a revolutionary way of, be, be, uh, of being. Do you feel that uh, there have been these uh, instances in the past where the Supreme Court in particular actually revolutionized the society? Uh, well, <laughs> <laughs> well... Yes, uh, in the context of the queer community, section 377. And in the other, in a series of judgments on finance, uh, the court has revolutionized society. Most importantly, for instance, starting from 1950 on the right to property, uh, the court upheld the right to property and said that you could not acquire land without paying adequate compensation. 
and Zamindari Abolition Act was therefore bad and struck it down. Now, that in itself did not revolutionize the country as much as the revolution that the reaction to that judgment brought about. And the moment a judgment comes, which is not uh, something that they like, they proceeded, the Constituent Assembly, B.R. Ambedkar, Pandit Nehru, the very people who we today idolize as people who gave us these rights, did not wait for the first parliament to be constituted, for elections to happen. They went ahead and amended the constitution whole hog and uh, revolutionized how the interaction between the courts, the fundamental rights and the legislature would thereafter be through the enactment of what we now call the ninth schedule, article 31b to the constitution, along with the right to property being taken away. Uh, one of the most important amendments was on the right to free speech because the Punjab High Court had struck down the sedition law. So again, these great votaries of free speech, Pandit Nehru, Ambedkar, rushed in the same First Amendment, a change to Article 19 1A and enabled the law of sedition to survive. And therefore, a vast area of our legislation is immune today from judicial scrutiny. And that is a reaction to the revolution brought about by, by the Supreme Court in 1950. Right. Um, fast forward to the new millennium. I think the biggest areas of uh, judicial activism and knowledge have been uh, the areas, I think, of environment mm -hmm. and probably in corruption. And the courts have repeatedly intervened in matters in environment. So, for instance, the CNG uh, order when all of Delhi's fleet was, been, uh, was uh, moved to CNG from diesel, a clean fuel, which for some time improved Delhi's air, uh, air pollution. We are sitting in Delhi, we are breathing poison. Today, I, I check uh, the AQI every morning. Today is 373. Is there anything that the courts do so that we are not forced to breathe poison 24-7 in this city? Courts should be a peripheral aid in bringing about change. But we can't let the political executive off the hook for a job that is theirs. It's very convenient for the executive, for bureaucrats, for politicians to simply say that, uh, look, the court is handling it, the matter is sub uh, there's nothing we can do about it. And just abdicating their responsibility and their role. I think one thing the court can do is tell the executives, tell the politicians, the law requires and the constitution requires that Delhi's AQI should be 150 by such and such date. If it does not become 150, I will hold the chief minister, the uh, relevant uh, ministers in the centre or bureaucrats guilty of contempt and proceed to punish them, right? Why do you take these nitty gritty decisions about what should happen and how when you have the power of contempt? So please use that power of, con of contempt where it's more productively used than to threaten free speech. Have you ever felt censored? I must confess, uh, Nishtar, that I've never curtailed myself because I feared a political backlash. I don't think uh, I've censored myself too much. And this, I must confess, is a problem that I see. Increasing number of people self-censoring, being so worried about something that will never come true. Uh, people are keeping quiet, saying, oh my God, the government is going to come after me and I'll be put in jail. The courts will come after me. They'll hold me guilty of contempt. The emperor has no clothes. This emperor of fear has no clothes. I assure you, contempt is highly unlikely to be used by the, uh, by the, by the courts. And the threat to free speech, other than a few very big ticket names that have happened, uh, does not happen. The government does not have the wherewithal and maybe not even the intention. Now, why do we always think the government has a bad intention? Uh, I don't think that they always do. It's not to say that they don't sometimes. Right? Mm -hmm. But it is not nearly as bad as people make it out to be, mm -hmm. either because they don't want to or I think more likely because they cannot. They cannot. I, and it also becomes, you know, uh, you know, uh, that I'm being persecuted or I'm being hounded, yeah. it kind of becomes a calling card of sorts. Yes. Do, do you feel that? Absolutely <laughs> right. And you know, there's a fair psychosis that happens. Mm -hmm. So for instance, Section 66A comes, uh, five uh, people are arrested, two girls about making a, a speech about Thakre. That comes in the media. And suddenly everyone says, oh my God, if those two girls can go to jail, I can too. So 10 million people keep quiet mm -hmm. because two girls have gone to jail. 
Now, obviously, those two poor girls should never have gone to jail. But do 10 million people really think that all of them are going to be sent to jail? We don't have enough space in our jail for that, right? So when you self-censor and you stop talking, you are doing a dereliction as your duty as a citizen. You have a right, but also responsibility to speak up. People are also scared that they won't get their due, that they would be passed over and uh, they, uh, they would perhaps be even penalized professionally, if nothing else. And, uh, you know, you are still uh, waiting for a sign-off, the final sign-off. What are your thoughts about, about the delay here? Uh, in my instance, I believe the delay is obviously because of my sexuality. And I think it's something the court should take up and, and do something about it, one way or the other. So that's just reality. You have to deal with it. Like college gym, it's a reality, you have to deal with it. <laughs> yes, the, and that's absolutely right. You know, I am one of those people who believe the collegium is wrong. Mm -hmm. There should not be a collegium system, that there must be, the NJAC had been brought about by uh, parliament to amendment. It was a good thing. Mm -hmm. It should have been given an opportunity to function. Instead, the court struck it down. Uh, but that is as opaque today as anything that uh, it replaced. If you say that there is no political interference in the appointment of judges, uh, I say in Latin, res ipsa loquitur, which is the thing speaks for itself, right? Uh, there clearly is. So why is the collegium system any good? So I'm, I'm completely anti the collegium system. It's, uh, it's completely everything that one stands for in terms of transparency. Mm -hmm. uh, there are decisions being made in back rooms, uh, which have everything to do with things other than merit. Mm -hmm. So, uh, I, I, I don't agree with the collegium system. But a lot of people uh, can, can turn around and say that you came to Qatar because your father was Chief Justice. That's an absolutely valid criticism and that's true. We see a very large number of people who uh, have become judges because they have a certain progeny. Now to that I'll say one thing, it is also by nature a self-selecting profession. Number of first generation lawyers is now quite high, uh, increasingly, but 25, 30 years ago when I joined the profession, that's how things were. Uh, the law schools had not come up, sprung up, uh, liberalization had not happened. By the I went to university in 89 uh, in a country which is very socialistic, there was no money. Of course I'm a product of my privilege, right? I'm not going to start disowning my parents. My father was an upper caste man, that by itself opened the door for, for me. My father was wealthy and therefore that opened doors for me. So I had a whole large number of uh, good things going for me. I don't know whether I'll be a judge or not, right? It's quite possible it may not happen. So if I, it doesn't happen, are you, you going to cry or are you going to what, what? Would you feel bad, very bad or not bad at all? Uh, <laughs> well, personally speaking, mm -hmm. I think I would be a bit relieved uh, because I've seen the life of a judge, oh, yes. not just uh, because of my personal situation, but even today the judges. The pay is bad, the work is hard, the life is tough, you are cloistered, you can't meet people, you're supposed to be aloof from society, yes, be, yet be constantly criticized. It's not a great thing. I'm doing extremely well, uh, I'm earning lots of money, I have my freedom. So for me personally, uh, it may not be a bad thing, but I would feel bad. Uh, because I'm not, I'm doing this for public service, but there is no one else other than me who's from the queer community who's in the, in the line. And we spoke about privilege. And if I, with all my privilege, can't become a high court judge, I really wonder how many more years we will have to wait before someone else from who's a first generation trans Dalit will become a judge, you know, that's sad. This government has actually, um, and this is going to be my, my last uh, question. So they, they, they've been accused of um, indulging in tokenism in making these grand gestures. Okay, the, um, you know, they, the party gave India the first um, uh, tribal president. president. And uh, you know, all, all of these, these tiny things, headline mm. management as some people say. Why aren't you that, that, that headline case then? Maybe they are, uh, that it's okay to be a tribal woman president, but uh, to be a gay judge is a step too far. 
in the Navdeh Johar judgment didn't give an affidavit saying, yes, yes, India has changed, the world has changed. Let us not send gay people to jail for their life for having sex in the privacy of their bedroom, right? Even something as low hanging fruit as that, they did not accept. If they're not making me because I'm an inconvenient uh, person of alternative sexuality, then I hope to God they find someone who is of an alternative sexuality who is amenable to them. Please, by all means, go ahead and do it. Uh, I don't see many candidates, but I'm sure if you look hard enough, you can find them.